آج کے مسلمان کا مسئلہ تو نہیں ہے مگر کئی ایسی چیزیں اور تصورات ہیں جو اسلام کے منافی ہیں اس کی طرف آخر کار لے ہی جاتی ہیں جس کے لوازمات پر بات کرنے کے لیے آج ہم نے محترم ادنان راشد صاحب کو دعوت دی ہے ادنان راشد صاحب کا تعلق یوتھ آف اما سے ہے آپ مشہور مصنف شاعر مورخ اور ہٹن یونیورسٹی لندن میں لیکچرار اور سینئر ریسرچر کے فرائض سر انجام دے رہے ہیں جن اسلام سے آپ کو خصوصی لگاؤ ہے آپ نے بہت سے بین الاقوامی سطح کے اداروں میں مختلف موضوعات پر لیکچر دیے ہیں آپ ٹی وی اور ریڈیو سے بھی منسلک رہے ہیں اب میں بلا کسی تاخیر کے محترم ادان راشد صاحب کو دعوت دیتی ہوں کہ وہ تشریف لائیں اور زیر بحث موضوع سے ہمیں آگاہی دیں lecture. Uh, I will be talking in the English language because that's the language I feel more comfortable with. Although uh, I may drop a few sentences, a few verses in the Urdu poetry here and there. Uh, so please bear with me. Can everyone understand English here? Everyone? Yes? yes. yes. So everyone feels comfortable with English. Um, because, of, because of the topic, the topic is answering atheism. And atheism is conveyed mostly in the world, in the English language. That's why I have chosen to deliver this, uh, this particular lecture in the English language. Uh, I can speak in Urdu as well. Urdu is my mother tongue and I am very comfortable with it. But I think due to the terminologies I will be using in the lecture, it is best to be consistent uh, with those terminologies and speak in the English language. But I will begin my lecture with a very powerful poetical expression by none other than famous Allama Iqbal. He titled this particular poetical expression Afrangzada, which actually means westernized. So he had this to say. تیرا وجود سراپا تجلی افرنگ تیرا وجود سراپا تجلی افرنگ کہ تو وہاں کی عمارت گروہ کی ہے تعمیر مگر یہ پہ کرے خاکی خودی سے ہے خالی فقط نیام ہے تو ذر نگار و بے شمشیر تیری نگاہ میں ثابت نہیں خدا کا وجود میری نگاہ میں ثابت نہیں وجود تیرا وجود کیا ہے فقط جہر خودی کی نمود کر فکر اپنی کر اپنی فکر کہ جوہر ہے بے نمود تیرا اقبال سو وٹ از اقبال سینگ ہیئر اقبال واز ایڈریسنگ اے پرابلم دیٹ ہی ہیڈ فاؤنڈ ان ہز ڈے اینڈ ایج ہی از ٹاکنگ ٹو پیپل ہو ہیو بیکم ویسٹرنائز ان دا مائنڈ They have been mentally colonized. As we all know from our history, this region was colonized by the British. The British Raj was firmly established in the 19th century, especially after the Indian mutiny or the War of Independence, depending on how you want to see it. In 1857, the natives, they rose against the British Raj Uh, and this is another lecture in itself, I will, I'm not going to go into the details. <clears throat> After that, the, the British Empire was firmly established and it was declared an empire and Queen Victoria was declared an empress. The process had begun a century earlier. In 1757, exactly a century before the Indian Mutiny, the British won a battle called the Battle of Plassey against one of the Nawabs of Bengal and there began the slow colonization of the Indian subcontinent. 
First, the British took over Bihar, Bengal, and Orissa, these three provinces, the richest provinces in the Mughal Empire. And the Mughals had already been declining politically. And with political decline came the economic decline and military decline and moral decline, you name it. And all the external and internal powers started to attack the, the Muslim hub of India called Delhi. Delhi represented the Muslim civilization in the Indian subcontinent. This is where your best poets, best authors, best philosophers, best theologians, best uh, uh, Jewish were born in the city of Delhi. For almost six centuries, this city was the hub of Muslim civilization in the Indian subcontinent. This is where the Delhi Sultanate was established. This is where the followers or the successors of Sultan Shahabuddin Ghori established a power hub. This is where the Mongol invasions of India were repelled. Nowadays, if you watch Indian news channels and you see a lot of rhetoric against Islam and Muslims, you see a lot of hatred being pumped against Islamic figures in the Indian um, mainstream media, which is very much dominated by the political, the ruling political party. And recently there were many attacks on personalities like Aurangzeb Alamgir and Tipu Sultan, for example. And there is reason for that. The Hindutva movement in India, backed by BJP, is adamant at removing Islam from Indian history, which is impossible. It cannot be done. Islam is an integral part of the Indian landscape. It cannot be removed. And they are in vain attempting to remove it. And one of the tactics is to distort the history of this region. If we forget about all other contributions of the Muslims made to the Indian civilization, there is one particular contribution, there is one particular favor the Muslims did to the Indian subcontinent that can never be forgotten. That was stopping the Mongol invasions. Mongols were invading India for over a century, for over a century. They had devastated land starting from China all the way up to Syria. It is estimated that almost 10 million people were killed by the Mongols within that region. And in fact, Delhi Sultanate was made by the Mongols because of the migration. The region today known as Transaxonia or uh, Central Asia, or in the Arabic language, Mawara al Nahar, was a hub of Muslim civilization. A lot of scholars, poets, theologians had to migrate to India to seek refuge because of Mongol invasions, and Mongols were not stopping. So they came all the way to India. They invaded places like Lahore. Lahore was attacked by the Mongols a number of times. Unfortunately, not many youngsters are aware of this history. It is very important for us to know this history so that we can better understand what's happening today, globally. So Mongols invaded India. They invaded Delhi. They invaded Lahore. They were close to Multan. And who was stopping them? Who was fighting against them? The Delhi Sultanate. In fact, some of the kings, they lost their sons. One of them was a very powerful king called Sultan Riyasuddin Balban, who governed for nearly 20 years. He lost his son, Prince Muhammad, uh, in a battle. And in that very battle, Amir Khosrau. You know Amir Khosrau? Have you heard of him? Right? A lot of uh, poetry in the Hindu language is attributed to him. Uh, you know, these singers are Amir Khosrow. Amir Khosrow was present in that very battle himself. He was captured by the Mongols, and in his Persian poetry, he actually describes the Mongols. 
So the point I'm making is that this one favor, the Muslims or the Muslim civilization or the Muslims who had become Indianized, they did to India cannot be forgotten. Perhaps India would have had a different history today if the Mongols were allowed to come in. But they were stopped by the Delhi Sultanate. So this was the civilization of Islam in a nutshell uh, and its contribution. And there's a lot I can say about this and this is another lecture for another day. So returning to my topic, answering atheism. Why am I talking about atheism today? So I started with the British Raj. In the 18th century, British merchants who had hired private armies to protect their own uh, interests, their economic interests, had suddenly woken up to the reality of the fact that they have become masters of three richest provinces of the Mughal Empire. They couldn't believe it. Not in their wildest dreams could they imagine that one day they will become the masters of the Indian subcontinent. They never planned it. They never intended it. They never dreamed about it. So within a short span of time, they were masters of three provinces. And then they saw the opportunity to expand. And this expansion happened. One after another, many provinces were taken. Finally, the last meaningful resistance was removed. And that was in the form of the state of Mysore in the south. Sultan Tipu, or Tipu Sultan, was killed in 1799, 4th of May. 1799, Suranga Patam was annexed and Tipu Sultan was killed in battle. And Iqbal paid lavish tributes to Tipu Sultan. By the way, uh, scholars of Iqbaliyat, or people who study Iqbal, they believe that the peak of Iqbal, in other words, Iqbal's peak in poetry is his Javed Nama his Persian collection, which unfortunately the Pakistanis are mainly or mostly uh, unaware of because we don't speak the Persian language, we don't understand it. Uh, that generation that spoke the Persian language died in the 80s and the 70s. Uh, and in the 70s, Persian language was removed from the curriculum and uh, a, a, a phrase was made famous in Makula, Pakistan, Pardo Farsi. Who knows it? Who knows it? Bechoteo. Right. You see, have you, have you noticed that none of the youngsters are aware of this? They wouldn't know about this. Right? In other words, if you study Persian, you have no future. And this is, this was the dilemma for us. Six centuries of civilization was taken away from us in one strike. And I'll come to that in due course very quickly. So I was talking about Tipu Sultan. So, so that you can understand the political background of the rise of atheism we face today in places like Pakistan and other Muslim countries where colonization had taken place. So until then, until the British had defeated Tipu Sultan, they did not feel militarily, economically, technologically superior to the local Muslim powers. And some of the Western thinkers and authors have acknowledged this in the, in the books. There is an author called William Dalrymple who has read his books or looked at his books. Only one person. Okay, thank you. William Dalrymple has written a number of books on Indian history. Two in particular very important books and I recommend, I strongly recommend these books. One is White Mughals. One is titled The White Mughals. The other one is The Last Mughal. It is a biography of Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal emperor. And it's a very powerful book. I recommend it strongly and it's written in a, uh, in a very objective fashion. He's a very good author. Uh, not because he favors us in any way, rather he is an objective historian who describes history as he sees it, right? So he was of the view, and in his book, The White Mughals, he argues that British officers or British administrators in India in the 18th century 
actually felt inferior in front of the Mughal civilization. They had become Mughalized. They started to wear Mughal clothes. They started to smoke hookah. They started to lean on couches. They felt inferior facing the Mughal civilization in India. They started to adopt Urdu language or even Persian language. They started to write poetry in the Persian and the Urdu language because they felt politically, economically, culturally inferior to the dominant power in India at the time. Even though it was in a sharp decline, the Mughal Empire was already declined, decline, or it had declined already, some of the British administrators felt it In fact, Tipu Sultan was still a standing power who had excelled in the fields of military technology and Pakistan is a garrison state, just like the state of Mysore. Pakistan is, a, is in a continuous state of conflict with uh, its neighbors, in particular India. And Pakistan, uh, the military institution in Pakistan can learn a lot from the history of people who are. I believe we haven't yet studied him properly. We know his name. We know about his martyrdom on the 4th of May, 1799. But we don't know the man and his achievements. And this is another lecture itself, so I'm not going to go into that. So until he was alive, the British felt inferior. They actually considered him an equal. But when he was killed, and his library plundered, his state plundered, his treasure taken all the way to Britain, and distributed among the looters, then the British started to feel a superiority uh, complex. They started to have the superiority complex that we are actually militarily superior. We are not only militarily superior, we are economically superior. Therefore, we are culturally superior. And then came the racial sense of superiority. We are racially superior. So then began a racism colonial racism. When the Indians, the natives were called blackies, they were looked down upon. They were looked as savages. The new generation that came to power, people who were actually reading John Stuart Mill, uh, a British philosopher, this was a new generation. They hadn't seen the Mughal Empire or the Mughal civilization. This was a new generation that came to power in the early 19th century. And when they came to serve in India, they had this racial sense of superiority, which was backed by military superiority uh, that came with economic superiority. And then they started to look down upon natives and their religions. Then systematically Christianity was promoted by missionaries. Missionaries were sent in and Christian missionaries were backed by the might of the British Raj and they started to preach openly to the Indians who were Hindus and Muslims mainly. And Muslims, of course, there was very little success as far as the missionaries were concerned. And many debates took place. In 1854, in Agra, there were debates happening between Christian missionaries and Muslim scholars. And this caused, or this created a tension between the two civilizations. And it resulted in the War of Independence, 1857. A lot of people think that the War of Independence happened because of this issue of cartridges. The British had invented these new cartridges and uh, you had to chew. One had to chew these cartridges to use them uh, in the matchlocks. Um, and these cartridges were made of, or in the manufacture, they used cow fat, which was, um, cows are sacred for the Hindus and pigs are haram for the Muslims. So cow and pig fat was used to make these cartridges and the Muslims and the Hindus, they thought that the British are now deliberately trying to impose their religion on the native forces. So they rebelled and lo and behold, India was in rebellion, which is a little history in itself. How did the British Raj actually impose its own civilization on the natives? It became a civilizing exercise. As far as the natives were concerned, 
They were savages. They were uncivilized, unlike the British. So they had to be civilized. And there were two ways of doing it. One way was to get them to adopt the civilized religion, which was Christianity at the time, which was Christianity at the time, the British Raj. And the other way was to introduce your own education system and remove any traces of previous civilizations. So in 1834, in 1834, Persian language was finally abolished. And English language was brought in slowly as the language of administration. So imagine this for six centuries, from the year 1200 to 1834, the Persian language was the state language. It was the language of the literati. It was the language of the educated class. It was the language used in poetry, in writing state documents, in state correspondence, even the language of the learned. The educated people, Persian, it was suddenly abolished by the British, 1834. So, of course, there was a reaction. There was a reaction from the, the ulama, from the scholars, and even Hindus who had adopted the Persian language, who had become increasingly Persianized, um, they had a problem with this. But within a generation, it was forgotten. And by the year 1860, the new generation had already become anglicized. And because the British became the masters, the political masters, more so after the War of Independence in 1857, every child who went through their education system was mentally colonized, not only physically colonized, that child, a native Indian child, whether Hindu or Muslim, was mentally colonized. And then we had some intellectuals who started to adopt the British way of life, the British way of thinking, and they became Afrangzada, which is what Iqbal was talking about. Tera wujud sarapa tajalli afrang ke tu waha ke imarat garo ki hai tamir. Right? This is exactly what Iqbal was talking about. And Iqbal had traveled to the West. He had studied in Germany, in Heidelberg. As we know, he did his PhD in Heidelberg in Persian metaphysics. And then he traveled to Britain, advised by his teacher, Professor Thomas Walker Arnold, who was also a philosopher, who had advised Iqbal to take a degree from Cambridge in law. Iqbal did that. And when he came to the West, that's when he realized the value of Islam and Islamic civilization. That's when Iqbal's poetry changed forever. He was not one of those people who was completely mesmerized by the pomp and the glitter or the military or the technological might of the West. What he saw was a kind of moral decline in the West. West was heading towards atheism. It had abandoned Christianity. For atheism, a lot of Western intellectuals were becoming atheists. And this was not because atheism was more intellectually satisfying or stimulating. It was because a lot of Western scholars had realized that Christianity doesn't make sense to them. And this process had begun in the 18th century. To understand an idea, you must understand its history, its background. This background, you must understand it. So where does this phenomenon today called atheism come from? Where does it come from? I believe the foundations were laid in the 18th century Europe. What we know today as commonly the European Enlightenment, the Enlightenment period. Who knows about it? Anyone the Enlightenment period? Sorry? I say, Renaissance is no, no. Renaissance is not the Enlightenment period. Renaissance began in the 15th century. Well, people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo 
and others like Copernicus and Galileo. These, these are the people who are writing in uh, the European mainland, Western Europe mainly, Italy, France, Britain, Germany. Uh, this is where the Renaissance took place, what we call Nishate Sania, right? The, the revival of the European civilization. The Europeans suddenly woke up to a civilization that was dead for them. But amazingly, it happened through the bridge of Islamic civilization. There was no way for the Europeans, or there is no, there was no um, prospect for the Europeans to wake up to a civilization they had lost without the civilization of Islam. It were the Muslims who had in, in Europe, I mean, the ones in Spain, in Al-Andalus, and in Sicily, they are the ones who had um, resurrected the works of Aristotle and Plato and other Greek philosophers and then wrote extensive commentaries in the Arabic language on these philosophers and produced original works. These original works were later on translated into the Latin language for the Europeans and then the Europeans adopted these works and it was in the Renaissance period when the Europeans had suddenly woken up to this civilization called the ancient Greek or classical civilization and that's why this period is, on, is, is known as the Renaissance. But I am talking about the Enlightenment. Renaissance period was not particularly atheistic. No. Atheism as an ideology, as um, uh, a system of thinking was not promoted during the Renaissance. It happened in the 18th century, between the year 1700 to 1800. This is the period in this century were born people like the French philosopher Voltaire, David Hume, the British philosopher. We had people like Immanuel Kant, who was born in Germany. So these are the masterminds of modern atheism. These are the people who wanted to break away from religion. And what religion were, we trying to, were, were they trying to break away from? They were breaking away from church oppression. They found the church to be highly oppressive. Are you getting bored? Yes. Are you sure? Yeah, English is a very difficult Do you all understand what I'm talking about? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, I'll continue. And a lot more interesting stuff is coming in due course, inshallah. Right? So this is the Mukaddama, the beginning, the introduction of the lecture. Okay? The background history of atheism, where it came from, and how it reached you, and why it has become fashion today. Why it has become fashion today. We'll talk about that in due course. So, Hume, Voltaire, and Kant. Hume was an extreme uh, empiricist. He is one of the authors who had written on epistemology, the theory of knowledge, how you get to know the truth. And his view was that you can never know anything for certain. You can never be certain about anything. But if you think about this very statement, which is what the Western civilization today is based upon, what we call extreme skepticism. Extreme skepticism. This is what Western civilization today is based upon, this very idea. Hume, in my view, is the founding father of the current Western philosophical thought. And this is no exaggeration. Hume is the founding father of current Western philosophical and scientific thought. He is the founding father. And it is this statement that is the core of Hume's thinking. You can never be certain about anything. But if you think about this very statement in itself, this statement is problematic. Who wants to help me? How? G. Thank you. This statement in itself is paradoxical. It's contradictory. Hume said you can never be certain about anything. In other words, we cannot be certain about what Hume is saying. Right? So, as soon as this founding principle of the Western civilization as we know it today, and I don't, want to be, I don't want to be crude, there are many great things about Western civilization. There are many beautiful things about Western, Western civilization. 
There are huge achievements of Western civilization which we must cherish and praise. We are a people of justice. We are not a bunch of bigots and a bunch of haters, for, for that matter, to use a crude word, that we will reject any good deed done by anyone. No, just because of certain negative uh, thought processes. I believe Western civilization has great achievements and we can learn a lot from them. But it is not the end. When it comes to morality and ethics, there is nothing the West can offer to the Muslim civilization. Nothing. Nothing. And I'm very, very clear on that, as we will see in due course. So Hume was an open atheist. Kant, a German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, was not an open atheist. It is thought that he was actually a deist. Uh, who believed in some kind of supreme entity who made this universe. But he was an extreme skeptic as well. Voltaire was also an anti-religion activist, but was not an atheist. And the French Revolution was the peak of this thought. This thought translated into eventually the French Revolution. Francisi in Palau, one of the bloodiest revolutions in human history. And what was the revolution about? It was about getting rid, rid of the ancient regime, the old order, which was based upon monarchical as well as religious system. So it was designed to abolish religion. It was designed to abolish religion. And there is no doubt that there was a group called the Illuminati, now, you may be thinking this guy is a conspiracy theorist, right? Now, he's, he was perfectly fine so far, thus far. Now, he's going into a territory where he is going to sound controversial. No, I'm not. I'm not going to present any conspiracy theories in front of you. I am going to state facts. And facts are based upon evidence, right? Yes? French Revolution was directly led by a coalition of Atheists and deists. And the sole purpose of this revolution was to abolish religion and the monarchical system and bring about a system that can facilitate atheism and deism. And some of the European history was used as an example because Europe was not the land of freedom of speech. It was, it wasn't. In fact, Europe was civilized as we see civilization very recently. Did you know as late as the 18th century, he had no real power. He was alive. Or whatever the scholars in the Ame who sort of did that. Sun Satraso Asita, Europe may. Or Tonko Zinda Jalai Jatata. Women were being burnt alive for being witches. Which, you know, witch hunting? Have you studied the history of witch hunting? I mean, I, this, is an, oh, this is an open invitation. Hundreds of thousands of women, hundreds of thousands, Lako Orte, in particular, Orte, were burnt alive at stake in public squares. Islamabad is the most square in the world. I don't know where it is. Yeah, zero point. Where is it? Faisalabad. Where is it? Where is it? You all know it, right? Imagine on a public square, and I don't want you to imagine, 10 women are being burnt alive. And, uh, and there is a spectacle. There is a spectacle, everyone's watching. You know, Dal Senior Bichi Jati, you have cricket matches, you have a lot of crowd, you have a lot of sweets, you have a lot of sweets, right? This is how it was. 
and from the year 1450 to 1750, within these three centuries, hundreds of thousands of women were being burnt alive for being apparently or allegedly witches. They were doing magic and they were accused of being witches and they had a process. This is another topic in itself, I'm not going to go into it. So I'm giving you pointers, parameters. You can go and research these topics in your own time. So some of these European philosophers and then heretics were being burnt alive. Who was a heretic? Who was a heretic? Heretic was someone who disagreed with the mainstream church opinions. Whether you were a Protestant or a Catholic, Catholics were burning Protestants, Protestants were burning Catholics. And this is happening during the Enlightenment period, which is known as the Enlightenment period in the European history. The Enlightenment. Is Doran Hazaro Log Zinda Jalai Jarite by the church, by the Christian church, the established church, uh, backed by the state, and this was happening all over Europe. To both sides philosophers, they couldn't express their opinions openly. They disagreed with the, with the Christian doctrine because they studied Christianity thoroughly. One of them was Isaac Newton. Who knows Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton. This is, I believe, uh, science is the main subject here in this university, right? Yes. yes? Right, so you should know Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was one of those people who was writing his theology in secret. He couldn't write openly. There were others who wrote openly and they were attacked. Some of them were nearly burnt alive at stake. You know Galileo? Right? Uska kasur kya tha? Uska crime kya tha Galileo ka? Kya kasur tha uska? Usne kya bol diya sense ke against? Kya kya diya usne? Uski kya theory thi? Sun? Right. No, no, no. It was the other way around. Yes. So his view was that the solar system is heliocentric, not geocentric. The church view for centuries until the time of Galileo was that the, the solar system or the universe is geocentric. Harchizu was the mean kegit gumpiye. Lekin Galileo, obviously being an astronomer, a scientist, he observed. And his observations led him to believe. And by the way, he took his theory from Copernicus. And Copernicus was reading people like Ibn Nasis and other Muslim philosophers before him. Right? So his theory was that the solar system is heliocentric. Actually, the sun is in the middle and other planets are going around the sun. Uspirsky Jan Pazgi. He was in trouble. And he was put through inquisition. Yani he was asked to retract or you will die. So he had to suppress his opinions. This was the Mahod in Europe at the time. A lot of the philosophers had already apostatized from Christianity. They had left Christianity because of a number of reasons. Firstly, the Trinity didn't make sense. So there were three reactions in Europe to Christian dogma or the way Christianity was practiced within the European civilization. There were three main reactions. I'm cutting it short. And if you want to go into the details, some of the details are shared. There are a few books I can recommend during the Q&A, right? One reaction was outright apostasy. I don't believe in this. This is all bakwas. This was one reaction, right? Christianity is false, therefore no religion can be right. Islam was not an option for the Europeans. And whatever Islam was known to the Europeans, it was known in a distorted form. It was already distorted. The picture was Islam ki tasweer mask karke jo hai, wo Europeans ko dikhai ki jo authors ne jo likhe the Islam ke upar, unne Islam ki tasweer aisi dikhai Europeans ko, thinkers ko, ke wo log Islam ko kabool nahi kar sakte. Rasoolullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ke upar biographies likhi ki, and the title would be The Nature of Imposture. The Nature of Imposture, a biography of Muhammad. You know they used to spell Muhammad like Muhammad, M E H. M -E -T. It was like a Turkish pronunciation because the Turks, the Ottomans, were the biggest threat to the Europeans, so they thought everything Islamic is Ottoman. Right? So, 
The picture of Islam was distorted. Islam cannot be an option. Christianity is false. Then there is no religion. Sorry. Some, those who could not reject the idea of a supreme being, a supreme entity, a creator, became deists. Deism is a position that there is a creator, there is an entity who created the universe, but this entity is like an absentee landlord. He doesn't take an active part in the running of the universe. He just created it and he left it to run by itself. Then came the third and the most extreme reaction to the European situation, which gave rise to the notion of secularism. And liberalism came from secularism. Right? Right? Pakistan me kate na liberal. Right? Have you heard this before? I'm liberal Muslim. Right? Oh man. Right? I'm a Kala Goron. Have you understood? Does it make sense? I'm a Kala Goron. This is why liberalism is bad. No. Our conception of liberalism is something different to what the Europeans think. European conception of liberalism, what is it? If you want to be consistent, if you want to wear a badge, if you have to wear a badge, then understand the badge. Know what the badge stands for. To give you one crude example, would you ever wear a badge saying rapist, rapist? Huh? Rapist. Kabi aap fakar se kahi yama rapist. Audu billah. Kahi ya? Ya kabi aap ye badge wear kahi yama murderer. Nahi. Uski wajah kya hai? Uski wajah kya hai? You know exactly what a rapist and a murderer means. Right? Yes? Yes. Lekin you don't know what a liberal means. In the year, where the term came from. The term came from Europe. Liberalism and being a liberal is a European concept. What does it actually constitute? Jin Lobar liberalism ke upar likha hai. Jo philosophers, liberalism ke jo founding fathers hai. People like John Stuart Mill, David Hume for example, who is cited very often by liberals. Or Thomas Paine. Right? Read their writings. And Europeans are living by liberalism. They are very consistent. They know what liberalism means. It means an individual has freedom so long as it doesn't impinge upon another's freedom. Let me explain. And I want to be crude about this so that you understand what being a liberal actually means. If you are, there's no such thing as Islamic liberalism. It doesn't exist. Islam is Islam. Liberalism is liberalism. So what does liberalism lead to? I'll give you a few examples. Who has been to Holland here? Who has been to Holland? Dutch land. Who has been to Holland? Right? <laughs> Sometimes these, again, this is another form of racism on the part of the Europeans. You are savages. Don't get me wrong. Okay, this is the reality. This is how it is. You don't deserve to come to our countries. When you apply for visas, you are filtered. Only the ones with money, with a lot of properties, plazas, businesses, they get through. Because they're going to go and spend money. But those who don't have these things to show, you will not get the visa. Because you will not go and spend money, you will take money. Right? This is how it is. Holland is a country right next to Britain. Actually, it's across the channel. It's very close. Half an hour flight. From London to Amsterdam, I don't think it's more than an hour flight. I haven't flown into Amsterdam. I've been to Holland, but I haven't flown in. I drove from Sweden. Um, there is a place in Holland, in Amsterdam. It is a market. Are you listening? Are you listening to me? Liberalism manifest. Liberalism being consistent with your values. This is how it looks. There's a place, there's a market in Holland. And in this market, you see living women, living, not statues, living women standing in cases. There are glass cases. There are living women standing there with the prices on the glass. And 
they people are walking past jis tarah aap kabhi etwar bazaar to gaye honge na right etwar bazaar gaye na to wahan par aapke sides pe stalls lage hote hain beech mein se aap guzarte hain aise jaise se right aur is tarah bhi sabzi ko sabzi wala hoga koi kapdon wala hoga koi you know there are different stalls this place is specifically for women they are selling themselves because liberalism allows that they are selling their bodies and the souls for a price and because they are individuals they have this freedom to do so because they're not impinging upon someone else's right they are actually fulfilling their desires as they deem fit because they're not harming they are not directly harming another individual so anyone who is interested can pay the price and be with them and they are living women standing in cases in glass cases this is liberalism now those who call themselves muslim liberals or liberals at all ask them to substantiate this or support this do you stand by this anyone no anyone so jab koi liberal apne aap ko kahe usko kahe bhai agar liberal ho to phir liberal ho right aadha fikr aadha bater ye kya baat hui aadha musliman aadha liberal right this doesn't make sense so i think our conception of liberalism is being open minded being tolerant being generous this is fine this is islam this is not liberalism this is fine agar aapka matlab liberal se ye hai ki aap liberals hain aur aap ye values you uphold these values there's nothing wrong with that that is very nice that is you know this is something that needs to be cherished lekin if you wear a badge at least study it at least do research on it because it means a lot of things it leads to many conclusions it leads to a lifestyle it leads to a philosophy that you cannot possibly sustain now porn industry pornography you know what pornography is right thankfully it's banned in pakistan lekin pakistanis mashallah they always find ways around huh they are always ahead of so where is it made most of it kahan produce ho rahi hai kahan ho rahi hai india mein bhi ho raha hai right because wo abhi tak colonized hai they have adopted that civilization all heartedly they don't know what they're doing they're confused right right it is being produced on a massive scale it is a multi billion dollars industry and if you study academic journals which i have had the privilege of there is one particular scholar i strongly recommend to study on the effects of pornography on the viewers and the indulgent per per persons right this scholar is called her name is diana e russell diana 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 is called in pakistan mein diana e right diana e russell her name is she has written articles on this issue right this is a product of liberalism there is nothing wrong with people indulging in porn or pornography having acknowledged clearly that it has a very bad effect on the society but in liberalism individual freedom is given precedence over social well being this is the underlying philosophy societies come after individuals individuals are more important they have the right to ex exercise their desires right and if it has a bad impact on the society then be it guns laws in america guns laws even though there are mass shootings taking place in american universities and institutions ek bachcha guns utha ke school mein jata hai aur spray kar deta hai pure school ko and these weapons are deadly weapons and he might or she might end up killing a hundred students easily right or there was this massacre uh, this crazy guy from a hotel he was shooting at a at a concert a densely populated concert you know the one i'm talking about yes the concert shehar mein hua tha ye ji dallas mein hua tha was it dallas he was from a hotel window he was shooting down on thousands of people 
Why are they not banning guns? Individualism, liberalism. It is an individual right to own a gun. Now, an individual may lose his mind and go and kill hundreds of people. Now, that's another matter. But individual right takes precedence over social well-being. So pornography is allowed on those bases, even though there are direct links between rape and pornography in the West. Diana E. Russell, her research found that in 56% of rape cases, 56% of rape cases, rapists replicated the behavior they had come across in porn videos. So this has a social impact. This is why, you see, we don't need liberalism. Islam, which gives precedence to society over individual. Islam prevents the disease from occurring. This is why porn is not allowed in Islam. Period. It affects the society badly. Women cannot sell themselves in the cases because they might have the right to do so, but this has a bad impact on the society. Therefore, it is not allowed. And the list can go on and on and on. Coming back to the issue of atheism. So liberalism is an offshoot of secularism, secular thought. Secularism came about as a reaction to what was happening in Europe, the church history, church oppression. People were not allowed to express their opinions openly. So some of these scholars, these philosophers who had apostatized from Christianity, rebelled and rejected the idea of Christianity and it ended in three reactions. One was deism, another one was atheism, and another one was Unitarianism, where some of the scholars had rejected the doctrine of the Trinity, which is the core doctrine of mainstream Christianity. They rejected it and they adopted the idea of Unitarianism. And then, lo and behold, in the 19th century, a lot of the philosophers followed suit and they also became atheists because they did not believe in Christianity, so in the name of rationalism, in the name of rationalism, they started to come up with atheistic ideas. And then this was put through the education system, and atheism was used as a force to promote racial superiority as well. In fact, Darwin's theory, Charles Darwin, who, who presented his theory in 1859 uh, in his book, Origin of Species, in this book he presented a new theory that species evolved from um, primates and but again this is another topic in itself uh, and that theory was used by the British Raj to the maximum and British administrators started to think that they are racially superior they are more evolved than other human races so non-white human races are actually still in the process of evolving they haven't fully yet evolved and this was taken from another of Darwin's book called The Descent of Man, in which Darwin clearly states that the Caucasian races, the white races are or appear to be more evolved than non-white races. So a lot of this was used to promote atheism. And in the 20th century, through the education system, Western education system, which was left behind by the colonial powers, atheism is being promoted now uh, on the mainstream Western media outlets deliberately. Now, I believe powers that are governing uh, Western governments, you know, Western governments are, are, are also being governed by some powers that are unknown to the masses, right? Western governments are influenced. They're not independent. Donald Trump is not the president of America. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Donald Trump is not the president. Do you think Donald Trump is the brain behind America? Do you actually think that? No. Hello? I don't even think he was the brain behind his own business. He wasn't. I don't think he was running his business. It's impossible for him to succeed that much if he was running that. So it is not him. It wasn't Obama. It wasn't Tony Blair or David Cameron or, or Theresa May. These are not the people who are running the government. It is the policy makers. The policy makers are mainly bankers and media pundits, media bosses. 
people like Rupert Murdoch and these guys. These are the people who are actually, actively promoting atheism. They're the ones who give platforms to people like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and, and Dennett, right? These are the guys who are making them look like um, the, the intellectual giants of the world today. But if you think about their thinking, you come to realize that they need help. They need psychological help. Who knows Richard Dawkins here? Anyone? Richard Dawkins. What is the most famous book he has written? The God Delusion. Right. Richard Dawkins is a man who doesn't believe in morality. He may have personal morality, but because he wants to be um, a consistent atheist, because he's the arch apostle of atheism in the world today. He is the main proponent of atheism, atheistic thinking in the world today. He does not believe in morality in the sense that uh, morality can vary from person, from person to person, from time to time, from place to place. So morality is not contingent upon a static agent. It is not coming from one entity. Rather, because God doesn't exist to him, God doesn't exist to him. That means there can be no morality. So how do they get the morality? And this is what Enlightenment European philosophers have left them with. And this was a point that was raised by European philosophers, even those who were atheists. People like even Voltaire. Even Voltaire, the French philosopher who was anti-religion, he stated in his writings that if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. It would be necessary to invent him. Why? Because if you remove God from the picture, then what follows is anarchy, chaos. Because God is the moral anchor. God is the one who gives you morality, moral values. He tells you what's right and wrong. If morality becomes a subjective issue, which depends on the human mind, then it becomes a subjective matter. Morality may vary from place to place, from place from time, time to time. So that's why Fred, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher, Iqbal was heavily impressed by him, uh, not because of his atheism, but because of his thinking. He was a very intelligent man, no doubt. Friedrich Nietzsche uh, was um, a German philosopher in the late 19th century. He died in the late 19th, 1890, I think he died. And he stated, God is dead. Audu Billah. This is what he stated. God is dead and we have killed him. He was looking at the European civilization and he said, we have killed God. And now we are cosmic orphans. We have been left without any moral guidance. So when you remove God from your life, what happens? You form your own morality. And then you have to rely on philosophies like consequentialism, which is an offshoot of philosophy called utilitarianism, which is what the European civilization again is based upon. Consequentialism. If actions have bad consequences, then they are forbidden. If they do not have bad consequences, then by nature, they can be allowed. And this is why recently Richard Dawkins tweeted that why don't we consider cannibalism? You know what cannibalism is? Yes. What is it? Eating human, flesh. eating human flesh. So they said, when humans die, why don't we eat their flesh? What's wrong with it morally? If God doesn't exist, what's wrong with it morally? There's nothing wrong with it. You can eat human flesh. It benefit, if it has benefits, if you can cook it, if you can spice it up, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going further than Richard Dawkins. If you don't believe me, you can go and check his Twitter account. He said this. And why is he saying this? He is a man who has written multiple books. Are you listening to me? Yes. This is what it leads to. This way of thinking eventually leads to crazy thoughts. If he is consistent with his philosophy, then there's nothing wrong with that. Lawrence Krauss is another very active atheistic um, activist who actually advised Obama on science. He had a debate with us in London 
We had a debate in UCL, University College London. Uh, and in this debate, he was asked, and the clip is online. You can go and watch the clip. It is titled Hamza versus Lawrence Krauss. Who's, has anyone seen this clip? One person, two people, right? In this clip, the person, Hamza, who's a Greek convert to Islam, who was debating him, asked him a question. That if we remove all the harmful elements, is incest morally wrong? You know what incest is? Yes. Incest. You know what it is, yeah? Yes. It is a relationship between a brother and sister or a, or a son or a, and a mother, right? A physical relationship. He was asked, is incest morally wrong? He said, if the harmful elements are removed, then there is nothing morally, morally wrong with it. This is what it leads to. So if you remove God from your lives, then you may do what you want. There's nothing right. There is nothing wrong. It all becomes subjective. This is what we call argument for morality. This is what we call argument for morality. So this is what it leads to. That's why the Western civilization, today, there are people in Germany who are campaigning to legalize zoophilia. These are some extreme examples. Don't get me wrong. This is not the norm of the Western civilization. No, this is not. I'm saying there are people who have the audacity to argue like this within the framework, within the liberal secular framework or atheistic framework of European or Western civilization. They are asking to legalize zoophilia. You know what zoophilia is? You know what zoophilia is? To legalize having sex with animals. They are asking the government to legalize it and regulate it. Have places where people can actually go and do this. And apparently there were places in Denmark where this was already happening. Where sheep were beautified. You know? Can you imagine this? I mean, this is not a joke. I'm not trying to be funny here. Right? And a guy is coming and having a relationship with the, with the sheep. Right? Or even other animals for that matter. So if, if there is no limit to human desires, human perversity, if it's not controlled and regulated, then if God doesn't exist, you can do what you want. There's nothing wrong, there's nothing right. So this is what it eventually leads to. And this is exactly what's happening in the Western world. This is why Iqbal was talking about the Western world in the way he did. Right? If you deny God, then you deny yourselves. You deny yourselves. And there are many more arguments which philosophers have presented. Um, the reason why today and I'm going to make this my final point because it's, I mean, I can talk about a lot more things, a lot more points I can raise. Um, but I will stop here and take questions in case you want to raise some points in the Q&A. The final point I want to make is the reason why atheism has become fashion in the Muslim lands, in particular in Pakistan, for some youngsters, is for two reasons. Two reasons. Number one, the ignorance of the Islamic civilization. They have not read Muslim intellectuals. Because six centuries of Persian civilization was taken away from you, the Diwan of Hafiz, Guristan, Bostan of Sheikh Saadi, the poetry of Khusro, the poetry of Abdurrahman Jami, the poetry of Khaqani and Nizami and Firdosi was taken away from you in one strike and then was imposed on you Western philosophy, Western literature, Western poetry and it is but natural to fall a victim to it. This is why Iqbal said something like Right? Thank you. Thank you.
सर मैं मेरी आंख का थैंक यू सो दिस इज वॉट इकबाल सेट इकबाल सेट के अफरंग का जलवा तजली अफरंग मेजमोराइज नहीं मुझे उसने इंप्रेस नहीं किया हालांकि इकबाल ने जिंदगी यहां गुजारी थी राइट यू लिफ्ट है क्योंकि मेरी आंख का सुरमा है खाके मदीना में जा मेरी आंख का सुरमा है मदीना की खाकी एट सीन इकबाल एट सीन The civilization of Islam because he studied it. He knew the Muslim intellectuals who had written before him. Iqbal wasn't just born instantaneously. Iqbal, Iqbal was made. He was made by the thinking, the philosophy, the theology, and the poetry of those who came before him. Iqbal was a huge fan of Hafiz. Hafiz Shirazi. He was a huge fan of people like Sheikh Saadi. He was a huge fan of Kusro and Rumi. Iqbal had seen these intellectuals, and when he read these giants, European thinkers, as much impressive as as they were, people like Goethe. Iqbal was heavily influenced by the German poet Goethe. Why? Because Goethe himself was heavily impressed by Hafiz. Who knows Goethe? Goethe, anyone? German philosopher and poet Goethe, who was a very prominent German thinker, and Goethe is the one who led the German Orientalism, and Germans became very close to Islam or Islamic civilization. They started to cherish it, even up to the Kaiser. Kaiser Wilhelm had actually sent a trophy to the tomb of Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi. He had placed it on his tomb in Damascus. Why did he do that? Why would he honor Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, Kaiser, German Kaiser? And the trophy was later on removed by Lawrence of Arabia, uh, which is another story in itself. So Goethe was heavily impressed by people like Hafiz. You see, we haven't read these philosophers, these thinkers. I know, my 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 friend, I know. Okay, thank you for that. So. There were others who had been mesmerized. They had been taken. People like Sir Syed Ahmed Khan. Sir Syed Ahmed Khan traveled to the West, and he was mesmerized by the Western civilization. And he came back, and he started to change Islam from within. He attempted. He was a very sincere man. I have, I have a lot of respect for Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, but he was in error when it comes to being impressed by the Western civilization. And Trying to come back and mold Islam within the the model of the West. Iqbal wasn't like that. Iqbal came back and he became a stronger Muslim. What did he say? Musalma ko musalma kar diya tu fani maghrib ne. What does he mean by this? Musalma ko musalma kar diya tu fani maghrib ne. And the tribute he paid to Tipu Sultan in this. Shape. So we can go on and on and on. The point I'm making is that once you study your own civilization, this is the reason number one why youngsters lean towards that way of thinking because they are completely ignorant of their own civilization. They have not studied their own theologies, their philosophers, their thinkers. Second is excessive westernization because they see technology, they see advancement, they see organization. They see, you know, media devices in their hands made in the West or made by the West, so they think that this is it. This is the way to success. No, it is not. Material success, material advancement doesn't always lead to spiritual strength. No, it does not. It doesn't always lead to moral success. And I can give many examples in this regard. I'll stop my lecture here for today because my time is running out. So I will take a few more questions. Thank you so much for listening. You are welcome to ask questions. You have uh, five to ten minutes to ask questions. You're more than welcome. Please, please bear in mind that there are there are many ideas I couldn't express and I couldn't expand on. If you think I have left something out, feel free to ask. 
And many students or many kids or many children or many youngsters, uh, they have questions and they think, if I ask the question, I'll be judged. Don't think that because you won't be judged here. You will be helped or you will be responded to in this city. No one will judge you. Okay, I know what the problems are. I know how people can think and how people can end up uh, thinking in a certain way. So there's no judgment here. You can ask any question you like. Yes, anyone. Who's, who's the star? Yes. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, thank you so much for delivering this lecture. Um, so uh, my question is that you mentioned that we have uh, an anti uh, bad version, bigger version. Okay. So what when we look back at our own civilization, we are basically divided in sects. We are what, what we look up to are Maulvis and uh, Ulamas, who are practically we would say divided in something. Right. So my point is that don't you think that we as young people don't have a place to look up to some people to look up to or yes actually learn from someone okay. because we when we go up uh, there's a right and a wrong whenever hmm. we battle atheism we talk about there's a good and there's always a bad hmm. so if there's something bad oh, good hmm. will take its place okay that is what philosophy says thank you thank you for that question very important question a very good question uh, my response to that question very quickly is that uh, you have parents they disagree, right? Mom and dad, if you tell me your mom and dad have never had an argument, then you are from a different planet, right? Your mom and dad argue, they have different views. Mom says, I'm going to put my dad says, I'm going to put my right? Mom says, I'm going to put my dad 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 says, I see it every day in my house, right? Okay? Does that mean we start to say, there is no mom, there is no dad? Huh? Because they disagree, there is no mom, there is no dad. Disagreement is a human phenomenon. And it is to be cherished. It is to be cherished. But the way it is expressed is important. When it turns into hate, intolerance, violence, that's when it needs to be stopped. Okay? Sectarianism does not necessarily always lead to doubts in Islam and God. Okay? Uh, we have an Islamic civilization. Is there nothing good in Islamic civilization? Is there no poetry in Islamic civilization? No philosophy? No architecture? No art? No theology? Nothing pleasant? Is it all Mulana Fazma Rehman? Right? Sorry. I mean, he's a famous figure, so that's why I mentioned his name. Right? A lot of people give his example. محمد اکبر who governed from 1556 to 1605, nearly 50 years. His period was the peak of the Mughal Empire. He is the one who carved the empire for his followers. Jahangir was an opium addict. He was a drunkard. And his son, Shah Jahan, had to undo a lot of things his father had done. And Aurangzeb had to do the same. Akbar, did you know he apostatized from Islam? Did you know that? He invented his own religion called Deen Elahi. In fact, some people claim that he claimed divinity. Subtly, indirectly, he started to claim that he was God or he was divine. How? What caused it? A complete lecture, a different lecture on history. Inshallah, on another day, we can do that as well. But what caused it? Because Akbar was uneducated. Akbar didn't know how to read and write. Akbar was, because he was 13 years old when the government fell on him, his father fell from the library stairs and he died. Hamayun died in an accident. And Akbar was 13 years old and he had no time to study books. So 
what happened was he created a place called Ibadat Khana where Muslim scholars were brought and they would argue with each other. Akbar had made the assumption that his scholars, the scholars of his time, are the best scholars in the world. This is where he went wrong. And Mullah Abdul Qadir Badayuni, who was an eyewitness to these events taking place, he wrote in his history, Muntakhab Tawarikh, that Akbar had assumed that all of these scholars who are arguing in front of him and are, are behaving like kids, like children, immorally, behaving immorally, and they were corrupt, they were stealing money and all those things were happening. He thought, Agar ye Islam ki sabse behtareen misal hai, then Islam cannot be true. That caused him to apostatize from Islam because he saw, or isi kism ka program in my TV channel bhi laga tha, Ramzan ki mahine mein aata hai, bade zoro shor se program lagta hai, jahan par चार पांच स्कॉलर्स बैठे होते हैं एक देवबंदी फिरके से और एक बरेलवी फिरके से और एक एलेरिंग्स होते हैं और बीच में एक माशाल्लाह हमारे बड़े अजीज भाई हैं आई थिंक यू नो द वन आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट मिर्ज़ा गालिब की मूवी वाले राइट वो बीच में बैठे होते हैं और वो उन लोगों को लड़ा रहे होते हैं इसका मकसद क्या है इसका मकसद ये है कि जो देखे जो कमजोर जहन के लोग होते हैं जिनके पास इस्लाम का ज्यादा इल्म नहीं इस्लामिक सिविलाइजेशन को नहीं जानते इस्लामिक तहजीब के बारे में नहीं जानते जो बड़ी बड़ी हमारी शख्सियात है शाह अल्लाह जैसी शाह अल्लाह मुहदस दिल्ली भी इस्लाम की रिप्रेजेंटेटिव है ना वो इस्लाम की स्कॉलर थे उनकी किताबें पढ़े आप दंग रह जाएंगे यूल बी ब्लोन हुए कम्प्लीटली इमाम गजाली इमाम गजाली को पढ़े आप इबन तैया को पढ़े आप आप हैरान रह जाएंगे कि कैसे लोग थे जीनीस इबन हजम स्पेन में जो थे या इबन क्या नाम था उनका इबन रश जो स्पेन में फिलोसोफर स्लैश थियोलॉजियन जॉइंट्स जॉइंट्स बिकॉज वी डोंट नो दीज पीपल वी एस्यूम दैट व्हाट वी टुडे हैव इज द बेस्ट अनफॉर्चूनेटली दैट्स नॉट ट्रू व्हाट वी टुडे हैव इफ एनीथिंग इज द वर्स्ट इज द वर्स्ट एग्जांपल एंड यू कैन नॉट जज इस्लाम बाय दीज एग्जांपल्स बिकॉज़ दीज एग्जांपल्स आर नॉट गुड एग्जांपल्स सो प्लीज इफ यू वांट टू जज इस्लाम जज इट बाय इट्स ओन मेरिट Uh, can I announce this? Okay. So I think we'll, I will return for Q and A. Q and A session. I, I have a question. I'm coming back for Q and A. Oh. I'm coming back for Q and A. So thank you so much for listening. And there's another guest coming to have some remarks. Thank you so much. I'll see you in few minutes. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Thank you so much for your precious time. I would like to call the Vice Chancellor of your University.